the last time I stood on a um, TED main stage was uh, 20 something February 2013, and it was in uh, Long Beach, uh, California. And uh, TED gave me their prize at that point in time a million dollars. I thought they would put it in my bank account, but they didn't actually. <laughs> they gave it to the university. But anyhow, um, here I am again on a TED main stage. Uh, I've spent the million dollars. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what, what happened next. I thought I'd give you a report on what I did with the money and where we are at this point in time. It's not all gone, there's just a little bit left. <laughs> um, when Ted gave me the prize, they also gave another prize, a smaller one, uh, to Sundance Institute to make a documentary on, on, the, on the whole project. The documentary will be called The School in the Cloud. At the moment, the documentary is not finished, but I got hold of a trailer and I thought uh, you might enjoy watching that. What is the future of learning? Could it be that we are heading towards or maybe in a future when knowing is obsolete? Could it be that we don't need to go to school at all? Could it be that at the point in time when you need to know something, you can find out in two minutes? My wish is to build a facility where children go on these intellectual adventures driven by the big questions which their mediators put in. It's a facility which is practically unmanned. It will be called a school in the cloud. Good teachers don't go to remote places. The remoter you get, the worse primary education becomes. I don't know how to build a school in the cloud because I've never built one. So I'm trying to figure out a design which, really speaking, belongs to children and is run by children. So that's what's going on. It's a great big experiment. Schools as we know them now, they're outdated. As soon as I started doing it and seeing the buzz and the enjoyment of the kids, it made me look at my lessons differently and the role of a teacher differently, less talking at the front and more handing it over to the children. I really like it because it's independent and you get to work with your friends. Kurakarti may or may not be different from the schools of England, so that's what we are going to look for. The idea is to have a complete glass front to a building here and a large screen for a full-size Skype-in mediator. In tunnel, we have to be in London. 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 All I ever really wanted to know about computers was how to turn them off. Hi. Hello, Rabin. Hello, Ajay. How nice to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look what I made. Can you see what this is? <laughs> you help a child to the point where if he wants to know something, he knows where to look for it and how to look for it. The more affluent children have people who will help them to learn anyway. But it's children in desolate areas who really desperately need to know how to learn. And I know that the internet does that. Learning itself is actually an emergent phenomenon, it's like a hive or like a thunderstorm. It's not about making learning happen, it's about letting it happen. I made a project. I made a project for TED. The way it works is that they tell you what will you do with the money if you get it. 
So um, I made out a project. The project was that I would build seven laboratories, seven learning laboratories. Five of them would be in India, and two would be in England. What sort of labs? Well, for that, uh, you need to know what happened before, which I won't go over, but what happened in the 15 years before the TED Prize was that I was able to figure out something which all of you know and all of you can figure out for yourselves in about two minutes, which is that if you have a question, you no longer need to ask a human being for an answer. There's something out there which can tell you what the answer is. What is it out there? Well, the internet, of course, we call it the cloud. To me, it's the first non-human, conscious and intelligent entity that we have encountered. We always thought that aliens will land from other planets and they'll be green with long legs and round eyes. It turned out it was not going to be like that. The alien entity is made up of four billion people, but it is not a person. It's a thing. You can ask that thing anything, and it tells you what you want to know. Given that situation, what happens to children and what happens to education? Well, there are reports from all around the world that children are not asking questions to people. Or at least if they have to ask a question to a person, they do that after they have asked their phones. Children don't want to learn how to multiply, divide, add, and subtract. Because they say they already know how to do that. It's done with phones. Children don't want to particularly to learn to read. Because they say there are things that can read out things to them, even if they don't know how to read. At the moment, they don't like to write by hand because they want to know why they should learn how to write by hand. Will they ever do it in the rest of their lives? So what happens in a world where reading, writing, and arithmetic are treated in such a cavalier manner? I wanted to experiment with that world. The idea was to create facilities for children, which has the internet, and where children can go in and do what they like, without any supervision or without any teachers. We could have presence there, but it would come out of the internet over Skype from somewhere, if the children wanted to. I work with children in the age group of about 8 to 12 or 13 years old, and um, they love speaking to adults over Skype particularly adults who, you know, like retired school teachers and things like that. And uh, I asked them, so why do you like this so much? Do you like it? Said, yes, we love it. Why do you like it so much? They said, you know what? We can switch them off. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, um, what I did after February 2013 was to first uh, look for places, and then start building. The seven labs are built to cover from the really remote area, such as areas uh, without electricity, without uh, healthcare, without schooling, nothing really, just the wild, through to middle class England, and all the ones in between. So the seven have all been built now. I finished opening the last one just this month. Uh, the very first one was built, uh, was open November 19, uh, uh, November 2013, the same year that I got the prize. You see over there a picture of that lab. It's in a town called Killingworth, England. It's actually situated inside a school. The school is called George Stephenson High School. It's, it's very close to George Stephenson's home, you know, the guy who built the first 
working steam engine. Um, in Killingworth, this is a room. It, it just looks like a, a nice uh, lounge with computers and an Xbox. And uh, the teachers, when I built it, they said, Sugata, this, this is a bit too much. Do you have any idea of what they're going to do with that Xbox? They're going to do nothing else except play with the Xbox. So I said, well, that's our challenge, isn't it? If you've gone in there to teach geography and the students are playing with the Xbox, it means geography is more boring than the Xbox. Then we should relook at geography, chuck it from the curriculum, or put it into the Xbox somehow. You can't tell the children, we'll take away your Xbox and we'll put, it to, put you into school to do other things. Uh, that's, not the, that's not the right way to engage children's attention. So here it is, a picture of what happens in there. As you can see, there are five children in the corner researching something or the other, and there's one on the Xbox. If you give them something interesting enough to do, they don't actually play Xbox all the time. It's, it was our misconception. Here's more, more of Killingworth. What they do in there is called a self-organized learning environment. It's very simple. Take five computers, take 20 children, put them in there, ask them a question. The question has to be an interesting one what we call a big question. What's a big question? Well, it can be, it can be all kinds, but uh, let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, a big question could be, can trees think? Okay. If you, if you give that question to children, they'll first sort of mutter with these trees. No, they can't. Yes, they, maybe they can. I don't know. And then you just leave them alone. And you say, well, I don't know the answer either. But why don't we look for it? And this will happen, what you see, what you see on the screen over there. And about 30 or 40 minutes later, they'll come back to you. And they'll come back not with childish observations. They'll come back with the nature of thought. They'll come back with the latest advances in biology, etc. That's called a self-organized learning environment. Here's one that we did in Kalkaji, New Delhi. Uh, it has on the wall a Skype-tin mediator, as you can see, and uh, it's a girls' school. Uh, the girls couldn't speak any English to start with. We opened it in uh, February 2014. Um, I put in a team of uh, observers to measure their beginning levels of English, which was close to zero. And then I said, we will measure every two months or so. After about three days, I was talking to this mediator that you see on the screen um, over Skype, and I, asked, and I was asking her, How, how's it going there? So she said, oh, very nice. Those girls are really nice. One of them said to me, when are you coming next? So I said, what? In what language did she say that? And the mediator said, in English. So when I sent my research team in after a month to measure the level, she reported that it's too late. It's done already. I've never seen anything happen so quickly, so I went to Delhi to ask the girls. I said, how, how, did, you, how did you do that so fast? Well, they gave me an answer which was quite astonishing. They said, you know that woman who comes on the TV screen? She doesn't understand anything other than English. <laughs> it's as simple as that. This is a little town called Newton Eycliffe in England, um, County Durham. If you, if you remember the map, it's in the northeast. This school is called Greenfields, and we have a, a, a school in the cloud there. What they've done is they've made one of their walls glass. On the other side is a green, uh, typical English green countryside. Inside, they've put in astroturf so that when you enter the room, suddenly you feel as though you're outside 
because of the turf merging in. And they put park benches and gas lamps and things like that, and a few computers scattered in there. So the children come into that room, and when you leave them alone, by the way, when you do a self-organized learning environment, you don't stay there. You, the teacher, don't stay there. You go out. So you start the session, and you go out. And from the other side, which is also glass, you can observe them. Anyhow, um, once, very recently in Greenfields, a group of eight-year-olds were sent into the room by their teacher. And the teacher said, and we often do this in souls, we say to the children, for the next 45 minutes, I can't talk to you, you can't talk to me. There's no communication. You're on your own. And there's the big question. So, so she did that. And uh, these eight-year-olds sort of went and they're, they're doing things. After a while, remember what she had said, you can't talk to me and I can't talk to you. After a little while, one of them came up to the glass window and he had a piece of paper in his hand and he held it up. On it was scrawled the words, help, we are stuck. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say you can't communicate with me, she said you can't talk to me. <laughs> okay, I thought that was clever thinking. Here's another view of Greenfields, another one. Chandrakona in Bengal, it's a, it's a pretty remote area. Um, if, you, if you can think of the, the map of India, think of the eastern side, the side that um, point or is close to Burma and Thailand. This is uh, somewhere there. Um, in Chandrakona, we, we have this, this structure and we built a school in the cloud. The parents came there, they're all farmers, and they said, uh, what are we supposed to do here? They said, you're supposed to send your children here. So they said, what for? So I said, you know, they'll learn things here. They pointed to the computers and said, from those TV screens. I said, they're not TVs, they're computers. They said, well, isn't that the same thing? I said, no, not quite. And they said, uh, who will teach them? I said, they will teach themselves. How can they? I said, they'll use the internet. What's the internet? Where do you go from there? This is what it looks like inside. If you can see it, you'll see at the far end uh, an Australian gentleman uh, who, who talks to the children. I hate to think of what will happen to their accents, but otherwise they love him. <laughs> In Chandrakona, three months later, there's a, there's a tall, slim, young girl there. Uh, so she was stand, standing around, she was, uh, I, I had visited. She said, we really love this place. So I said, for what? So she said, you know, you can find out all sorts of things here. I said, like what? What are you finding out now, today? She said, we were taught in school that plants are green because they have chlorophyll. And they have chlorophyll because they process light in order to make energy. I've come here to find out why chlorophyll has to be green and not blue or yellow or red. Do you know? I said, no, I have no idea why it has to be green. She said, okay, we'll figure it out. Three months. Uh, that's a view of the inside again. And here is our most remote area. It's called Korakati. It's also Eastern India. It's where the Ganges meets the sea. Um, it has nothing there. There's no electricity, no healthcare, no schools. Um, I won't say nothing. They have uh, Bengal tigers and, uh, <laughs> and um, the hooded cobra. Uh, and they have lots of children. It took some building, but I built that one. Uh, it's solar powered. It has a tower 
which is 45 feet high. Uh, I couldn't get the internet. I had a receiver. Kept raising it on bamboo poles. At 45 feet above ground, we got 8 megabit per second, 3G. So, so 3G met the Stone Age in there. In Chandrakona, the sessions are intermittent because of all sorts of problems. Um, the cabling runs on the ground, the, you know, the, the Ethernet cables which connect all the computers together. If you've seen those cables, they're kind of cream-colored. Uh, I have to remove them and lift them up somewhere because there is a very pale, thin snake which can change its color to the color of the Ethernet cable and sleeps there. Okay, a bit of a strange problem. You don't get these problems in schools usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, the internet comes and goes. The children walk for three miles, come to the school and find there's no internet and walk back three miles. Naturally, they are not very happy about it. But in the middle of all of this, what they do uh, do is that they find games, download them, and play them. Somehow, they're able to get up to that point. I asked them what a web page was quite recently, and they thought for a while, and they said, it's made by someone who is not here, someone very far away, who sends it somehow over those things which look like the cream-colored snakes. <laughs> this is the latest of the areas. I don't have a, a picture of it. It's a hexagonal. It's our best uh, structure. And in there, the studies are just beginning. It took a long time to build. It cost close to a million dollars. But there are a thousand children um, thousand very interesting children added to the cloud. Thank you.